Nine years ago, eyeballs from across the world turned to Russian Premier League outfit Angie Mahajkala. In the same year that PSG were acquired by the state of Qatar, and just a few years after Sheikh Mansour's arrival at Manchester City, Angie appeared to be the latest billionaire's plaything in the world of football. The likes of Samuel Eto, Roberto Carlos, and Goose Hiddink arrived in a region plagued by violence, all persuaded by enormous contracts that proved impossible to turn down. Nine years on, Angie's billionaire businessman is long gone, their squad is made up of a ragtag bunch of misfits, and they have been relegated from the top flight down to the third tier of Russian football. But where did it all go wrong? Mahachkala isn't a city steeped in football and greatness. The capital and largest city of the Russian Republic of Dagestan, Mahachkala, was founded as a fortress of the Russian Empire in 1844. Dagestan is the southernmost region of Russia, more than 1,500 miles south of St. Petersburg, but just 100 miles from the Georgian capital of Tbilisi and the Azerbaijani capital of Baku. Angie Mahachkala were only founded in 1991, shortly before the fall of the Soviet Union, becoming the city's second football club. Their neighbours, FC Dynamo Mahachkala, were founded in 1946, but never reached the top flight of Soviet or Russian football, and they were dissolved in 2007. Following the breakup of the Soviet Union shortly after their creation, Angie entered the third tier of Russian football in 1992. Seven years and two promotions later, they became the first top flight team from the city of Mahachkala, but they dropped back into the second tier in 2002. They won promotion to the Russian Premier League for only the second time in 2009, but outside of Russia, Angie weren't on anyone's radar prior to 2011. It was in 2011, however, that Angie captured global attention following a takeover by local lad turned billionaire businessman Suleiman Kerimov. Kerimov hails from Durban, which Islamic mystics once believed was the end of the world. Kerimov graduated from Dagestan State University with a degree in financial accounting and economics in 1989. He moved into the world of business just as the Soviet Union collapsed, a period which saw a number of opportunistic Russians get very wealthy. By the mid to late 1990s, Kerimov was one of those people, having made his fortune in financing and becoming a creditor to some of Russia's largest utility companies. Diversification came in the form of the airline, oil and investment industries, and it was through forming a holding company and some shrewd asset allocation that the Dagestan native began to accumulate some serious wealth. By the time his Gazprom and Sparebank shares had skyrocketed in 2008, Kerimov had an estimated net worth of $17.5 billion, making him the 36th richest person on earth and the 8th richest person in Russia. Midway through 2008, Kerimov pulled a lot of his cash out of Russia and invested billions in Western bank stocks such as JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs. Kerimov invested so much in US bank stocks that during the 2008 financial crisis, the United States Treasury phoned him personally to plead with him not to sell his significant stakes in the corporations. Following the fallout from that crash, from which Kerimov emerged badly burnt, he turned his attention away from blue chip stocks and towards the baby blue and mid cap companies, of which he could acquire a significant stake in and wield real influence. Kerimov is an intensely private figure. Rarely spotted in public life, he hasn't given a single interview in more than 20 years in business. His takeover of Angie in 2011 was the first time in which he drew significant attention from those outside of the world of business. Even after the takeover, there were no outlandish claims or unrealistic targets laid out by Kerimov to the press. He let the club's president, German Chistyakov, along with his checkbook, do all of the talking. Kerimov's first full season in charge heralded the arrival of Christopher Samba for more than €12 million, Brazilian international Jusile, for €10 million, Euros, and Yuri Zhirkev, who Angie brought back to Russia from Chelsea, for more than €13 million. Those signings alone would have been enough to raise a few eyebrows, but they were just the start of a much more significant raft of arrivals. Brazilian veteran Roberto Carlos was offered €10 million Euros to sign a two-and-a-half-year contract, despite the fact he was almost touching 40. Then came a fresh set of ideas in the dressing room with the appointment of the former Russia, Chelsea and Real Madrid boss, Goose Hitting. Most remarkable of all though, was the arrival of Cameroonian international Samuel Eto, a three-time Champions League winner from Inter Milan. A slew of other big name signings followed, but Eto's reported annual 20 million euro after-tax earnings were said to take him ahead of the likes of Cristiano Ronaldo and Lionel Messi as the best paid footballer on earth. Yeah, that will get you some attention. 
Angie had to pay these players such significant fees, not just because they were luring them to a relatively unknown club outside of one of Europe's top leagues, but also because they couldn't offer them the city of love, as PSG could, the glitz and glamour of Los Angeles like LA Galaxy, or even the relative soggy comfort of Manchester like Manchester City. In 2011, the same year in which Roberto Carlos, Goose Hiddink and Samuel Eto'o arrived at the club, Dagestan was described by the BBC as the most dangerous place in Europe. Dagestan is the most ethnically diverse region in Russia, but over 80% of the population adhere to Islam. Following the fall of the Soviet Union, Islamic separatists sprung up in the region, most notably in neighbouring Chechnya, which was left in ruins due to the Chechen War between 1994 and 1996. That conflict ended in a ceasefire, but in 1999, another Islamist group led an invasion of Dagestan in the hope of creating a caliphate and Islamic state in the region. Their attempts were unsuccessful, and after they were driven out of Dagestan, the Russian government launched a counterattack on Chechnya in retaliation. This led to the Second Chechen War, which spanned from 1999 to 2009, but by 2011, Dagestan appeared to have overtaken Chechnya as the most dangerous and volatile region, not just in the area, but arguably on the continent. Dagestan has been plagued with violence since the Soviet Union fell in 1991. A jihadist group named Shariat Jamaat was just at their peak when Eto'o and Co arrived in Dagestan. A mixture of religious extremists and opportunistic criminals and thugs, Shariat Jama, sought to impose Sharia law and see Dagestan break away from Moscow. Bombings, torture and killings became a daily occurrence. Angie's string of multi-million pound signings would witness little of this violence though, since not a single one of them lived in Dagestan. The Angie team resided in Moscow, and took the three-hour flight to Mahachkala only the day before a home game, training once on a night, and fulfilling their fixture at games with large numbers of heavily armed police, keeping the peace at all times. Once the 90 minutes were up, the players were taken to the airport in private buses, and boarded a private jet back to Moscow. It was a bizarre set of circumstances, which the club claimed was only due to Angie not having adequate training facilities yet, and not due to any security concerns. But when the club relaxed this policy and offloaded that hyenas, 20-year-old midfielder Gassem Bagamadov was killed by machine gun fire whilst driving. Dagestan is not a safe or hospitable place to live, and that is likely to be partly both why Angie Mahachkala burst onto the footballing scene, and also why they so quickly disappeared. It was felt in 2011 that a successful football club could bring about a more positive image and a distraction from the violence in Dagestan, somehow unifying the region around a common cause of supporting Angie. It is not the first, and it will not be the last time in which sport, and football in particular, is used as a tool to try and tackle public unrest. As far as I know, it has never worked, and it did not work in Dagestan. Football can provide short-term escapism for 90 minutes, but it is never a long-term tonic to deep-rooted problems. Nevertheless, when you have the world's best-paid footballer, along with the string of other lucrative signings and a world-class manager, there will be an uptick in form. That was the case at Angie, who enjoyed a record fifth-place finish in the Russian Premier League in the 2011-12 season. More big-money names, such as Lucina Traore, Willian and Lasana Diara joined the following summer, and Angie had their best-ever season, finishing third. Instead of viewing this as progress, Kerimov reportedly considered it to be an abject failure. He had personally invested more than £300 million in Angie's playing squad, and he was after a lot more than a bronze medal. In addition to their failure to win a league title, an injury time strike from Papi Cissé at Newcastle United had banished any hopes of a European title in the Europa League. It didn't help that in 2013, the same year that Kerimov became irked with the lack of results on the pitch, he suffered significant losses within his business ventures. Following Goose Hinnink's resignation, Kerimov appointed Sir Alex Ferguson's former assistant manager, René Muellenstein, while simultaneously shaving off some of Angie's highest earners. Samuel Eto'o and Willian departed for Chelsea, Christopher Samba and Yuri Zhirkov joined Dynamo Moscow, and Lasana Diara joined Lokomotiv Moscow. In just a few months, Kerimov reduced the club's wage bill by two-thirds, but cuts came to their point tally as well. Angie finished bottom in the Russian Premier League and were relegated, and it seemed their billionaire businessman had grown bored of his footballing escapade. The team won just three games all season in a dreadful campaign, but they did manage to win promotion back into the Russian Premier League the following season. Angie survived by the skin of their teeth over the next two seasons, and it was midway through the 2016-17 campaign that Karimov sold the club to the less known and presumably significantly less wealthy Osman Kadyev. In 2018, Angie were one of a number of Russian Premier League clubs to find themselves in severe financial trouble. 
both Amkar Perm and Tosno were dissolved at the end of the 2017-18 season, and there were concerns that Andrew could go the same way. Reportedly still carrying around 25 million euros of debt from their free spending Kerimov days, Angie lived to fight another day, but they were relegated last season and forced to release virtually their entire playing squad. Having failed to earn a Russian Football Union license, Angie were handed a double relegation, dropping into the third tier for the first time since 1996. The average age of the Angie first team squad, which is made up exclusively of their own academy players, is now 19, and I really cannot stress how ridiculous that is. The old heads in the Angie squad are two midfielders, both aged 23. When football in Russia was suspended this season, Angie was second from bottom of the third tier, and served as perhaps the best illustration in football of what can happen when a billionaire businessman treats a football club as a plaything and soon loses interest. Samuel Eto'o retired from football last season, Suleiman Kerimov is still a businessman and philanthropist, Dagestan remains plagued by violence, although Shariat Jama have largely been replaced by Dagestan's own branch of ISIL, who have since carried out similar attacks with similar supposed goals. Thank you all for watching today's video, I hope you enjoyed it, do give us a like if so, and obviously make sure you are subscribed to HITC7s.